Coming up on The Shield, VUTV has the latest information about the arrest of a Valparaiso University student involved in last week's shelter in place on campus. And also new details about an Indiana University student who was found dead over the weekend. We have had those beautiful sunny skies lately as well as a warming trend expected later on this week. But where are those April showers? We'll take a look at that in my weather coming up next on The Shield. Thank you for joining us here on The Shield. I'm Will Haney. And I'm Teddy Reithmeyer. It has been one week since a Valparaiso University student called in a false report of a hostage situation on campus. Shield News reporter correspondent Amy Vander Hayden has more on the details surrounding the case. Michael Clemens, a sophomore student at Valparaiso University, was arrested Tuesday night at Gellerson Hall for calling in a false report of a hostage situation at the Christopher Center. This was the scene Tuesday night as police agencies from Valparaiso and surrounding counties descended on campus after receiving a call at 7.04 that Clemens had taken hostages in the library. Students who were on campus shared with us their reactions during the time when the shelter in place was issued. I got a, a Facebook message saying, hey, there's something going on at the library. Uh, everyone roll call, it was for my fraternity's Facebook page, making sure that everyone was safe. And that's when I got the news, and at the time I let my boss know that something was going on, and she went to go investigate to see what happens, and it turns out that it's been going, it was going on for the last 20, 30 minutes or so. Mo there were parts of it where I was moderately scared, but when everything like came to and finally news media was breaking on it, it seemed like a hoax. Michael Clemens was taken into custody Tuesday night after his cousin, an officer in the town of Porter, identified the caller as Clemens. Clemens was formally charged Thursday with one count of intimidation and one count of false reporting. Both counts are level six felonies, the lowest level of felony in the state of Indiana. An investigation into the case is still ongoing and at this time. There has not yet been a court date set for Clemens. For The Shield on VUTV, I'm Amy Vanderhayden. Over the weekend, Indiana State Police confirmed the death of a missing IU student. Friends and family of 22-year-old Hannah Wilson came together to honor her memory, memory Saturday. Releasing dozens of balloons in her memory, Wilson was reported missing Friday afternoon. 24 hours later, police found her body in rural Brown County. An autopsy performed Saturday revealed she died of blunt force trauma to the head. Indiana State Police have arrested 49-year-old Daniel Messel on a preliminary charge of murder in connection with her death. The Bloomington Herald Times says he has a history of arrest for violence against women. Now I know for the past couple of days for me, Teddy have been a little bit chilly, but hopefully Emily has some good news for us. Emily, what do you have? So it is going to be getting a little bit warmer. Currently, we are below our average temperature as a forecasted high of 56 for today. And the average high is 65. And then the high record temp is 79. We'll have all that more coming up next. Thanks, Emily. And coming up after the break, an earthquake strikes Nepal. And we have details about continued protests in Baltimore. Stay with us. Interested in the television industry? Stop by our office in Schnabel Hall and join VU TV today. Good morning, Valparaiso University. What's a better way to start your day than with a new jam? And WBUR has just what you need. But if you close your eyes, does it almost feel like nothing changed at all? And if you close your eyes, does it...
broadcasting sports, news, weather, and music on air, online, and on campus. WVUR is my jam. On a campus plagued with terrible weather, Valpo students suffer from boredom with no motivation to leave their room. They begin to search for free movies and stumble upon Valpo's new free movie streaming website, where you get unlimited free access to recent movies like Despicable Me 2 and Jobs at the tips of your fingers. So if you're feeling bored, then don't wait. Grab some friends, find a seat, and enjoy a movie on movies.valpo.edu. Welcome back to The Shield. Thousands have been killed or injured following a magnitude 7.8 earthquake that struck the capital city of Nepal and was felt as far away as Mount Everest. But as Ivan Watson reports, aid is becoming desperately needed as relief and evacuations continue. This is the scene outside the main international airport here in the Nepali capital. Now, 48 hours after the earthquake struck, and, and you can see just lines and lines of people waiting for flights. They're trying to evacuate from this earthquake-stricken country. And this is a small airport. It, it's clear that it doesn't necessarily have the capacity to deal with both the aid that's starting to arrive in uh, military cargo flights coming from, from the U.S., from India, from the Netherlands, from Sri Lanka, but also the very many people who lived here or who were visiting as tourists. And uh, we just met Mr. Prabhat Singh. He's a minister at the Indian Embassy here. Mr. Singh, uh, tell me about this operation that your embassy is helping conduct here. What are, what are you doing exactly? We are taking out as many people as possible. We started with stranded Indian uh, tourists here. Now we've expanded our operations to cover in, in, uh, Indian nationals of long-term residency uh, status, Nepali citizens who are in urgent need of evacuation for medical reasons, or even other uh, persons of other nationalities who have to go out, leave the country and are stranded here because of lack of transportation. How, how many people have you moved out already? How many flights are you getting in and out? We have been flying, yesterday we flew in about uh, 15 flights. Today we, we intend to increase the number of flights. And we've already taken out, out about 2,500 persons. And from what I understand, uh, your community here has had casualties and even your embassy. Can you explain what happened? Yes. There was an old building inside the embassy compound which collapsed and a young lady died in the process of Indian nationality. Of, apart from that, we have figures of five Indian nationals having died in the aftermath. In the, in the break. The very difficult conditions to work with. Thank you very much for explaining and good luck with your operation here. Thank you very much. That's uh, Mr. Prabhat Singh. He's minister at the uh, Indian Embassy here uh, in Nepal. And it just gives you a sense uh, of the scale of uh, the relief efforts, the recovery efforts, the evacuation efforts after this enormous natu natural disaster. Ivan Watson, CNN, Kathmandu. At least 17 people have been killed and many others are missing following the 7.8 magnitude quake. Some of the deaths appeared to be caused by head trauma from falling rocks and debris. John Ryder, an American climber, said that he saw an avalanche was triggered by the earthquake and completely wiped out large sections of the base camp. Many of the climbers' group tents have been used as medic tents to house those injured. Ryder also said that blood was everywhere and there were so many injured that the doctors on site were not able to handle it all. On Sunday morning, helicopters arrived to the scene to take the most critically wounded and rescuers hope to evacuate more of the wounded, but for now, those who survived and the bodies of the dead are still at base camp. The mayor of Baltimore and the police commissioner urged protesters to remain peaceful as they continue to crowd the streets of the city following the death of Freddie Gray. Stacy Cohen reports. As protesters continue to pound the pavement, clashes between the crowds and the cops appear to be growing. A police car was swarmed, objects reportedly launched, and at least two people arrested for disorderly conduct and destruction of property. And still, no more details about the death of Freddie Gray. I've been recording it. The 25-year-old died Sunday, one week after a confrontation with police. At some point, Gray suffered a severe spinal injury which led to his death. A rally set for Saturday centers on demands for information 
and arrests. His dead body is right now ready to be buried and ready to be funeralized and memorialized. And still, the mayor of this city can't even get a report from her own police department. The big question surrounds this van and what happened inside it that left Gray in a coma. The Baltimore Police Department has suspended six officers and promised to wrap up a preliminary investigation by next Friday. I am clear that Reverend Gwynn of Minister Alliance has called for my resignation. That's not going to happen. I'm focused on my job. I'm focused on leading this organization. Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake has asked for an independent investigation. I recognize that there's frustration over this investigation, but I want to be clear. There is a process. Process that is unfolding far too slowly for many. I'm Stacy Cohan reporting. After months of delay and debate, Loretta Lynch was sworn in Monday as the nation's newest attorney general. The battle over Lynch was very political on Capitol Hill, but Loretta Lynch made history Monday by becoming the first African-American female to hold the office as attorney general. On Thursday, the Senate voted 56 to 43 to approve President Obama's choice for attorney general. Republicans in the Senate had refused to bring her nomination up for a vote until they got a deal in abortion language in an unrelated bill. The five-month wait for approval was longer than the seven previous attorney generals combined. Lynch is a two-time U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York. During her tenure, she earned a reputation as a low-profile prosecutor who worked well with law enforcement but did not back down on tough cases. The U.S. Supreme Court is set to consider one of the biggest civil rights issues facing the country this week. Today, justices began hearing a case that could decide the future of same-sex marriage. Sunlin Surfati reports from Washington. The question before the Supreme Court, do same-sex couples have the constitutional right to marry? At issue, a lower court decision that upheld same-sex marriage bans in Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Just two years ago, in a major gay rights case, the Supreme Court ruled same-sex couples already legally married had the right to receive federal benefits, but it dodged central questions. On Tuesday, the justices will face them head-on. Can states ban same-sex marriages, and do states have to recognize lawful marriages from other states? Those who are pushing for legalization of same-sex marriage nationwide say state bans violate equal protection under the law. This is a case about couples who have been together for years and all they want is to express their love and commitment to each other in front of friends and family. That's a basic American commitment, a basic American concept. There's no reason that they should be treated differently than other people. But John Birch will argue before the court the state bans should remain, saying this isn't about how to define marriage, but who decides. Is it the people through the democratic process where this issue has always been decided, or is it the courts? and it's the position of the states that the people get to decide. 37 states in Washington, D.C. now allow same-sex marriage, and CNN polling shows support is growing to an all-time high. Five years ago, 49% of Americans saw same-sex marriage as being a constitutionally protected right. Now, that number has jumped to 63%. After several delays, opening statements began Monday in the trial of movie theater massacre suspect James Holmes. Holmes is facing 165 counts for a shooting rampage that killed 12 people and wounded 70 more in an Aurora, Colorado theater in 2012. The attack took place during a midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises. Holmes has pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. His attorneys say that he was in the throes of a psychotic episode at the time of the shooting. Prosecutors, however, argue that he was sane and are pushing for the death penalty. The trial is expected to last about four months. And coming up next, Emily Kennedy joins us with your full Storm Shield forecast. Stay with us. On a campus plagued with terrible weather, Valpo students suffer from boredom with no motivation to leave their room. They begin to search for free movies and stumble upon Valpo's new free movie streaming website, where you get unlimited free access to recent movies like Despicable Me 2 and Jobs at the tips of your fingers. So if you're feeling bored, then don't wait. Grab some friends, find a seat, and enjoy a movie on movies.valpo.edu. For over 100 years, VU has trusted the torch for reliable and accurate accounts of campus happenings. 
And with an end of a century, we would like to say thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Velpo. We have been covering stories that will impact you both in print and online. For Players Spotlight and next week events, to the opinions you have, count on us as Valpo's most reliable source for campus happenings. Four-time winner of College Weekly of the Year, The Torch, home of the truth, celebrating 100 years of excellence in journalism. Those warmer temperatures on the way I was talking about. Uh, we'll have the details coming up in just a moment. But right now, 54 out in Valparaiso. A little bit colder by the Lake Gary at 50, and warmer to the west as Julia and Ottawa are in the lower 60s. But stepping it through as we progress throughout the rest uh, into tomorrow morning, we're going to be pretty chilly overnight in the low 30s and low 30s across the board. A little bit warmer off to our west is there in the lower 40s. But then warming up on the day on Wednesday, we're still going to remain a little bit colder as we're going to be about 54 here in Valpo. And once again, chillier along the lake as that lake is going to be keeping the lakefront pretty cool. So if you're planning on heading up to the beach, it's going to be very chilly up there. But for Thursday morning waking up, we're going to be a little bit warmer as we're finally going to be up in the 40s for our low. And then progressing forward, we're going to continue with that warming trend as well. But as far as rainfall goes, we have been very far below our rainfall totals. Year to date, we are currently at 4.38 inches and the normal average for a year to date is about 8.56. So we are uh, more than five, four inches of rain below the what we're is expected. Here is a RPM forecast model kind of showing you when we're going to be expecting that rainfall. Taking it out with a little bit of cloud cover and then um, getting a 7 a.m. on Wednesday. And then progressing forward on Wednesday, it does show some uh, showers and thunderstorms off to our west, but that is going to be missing us and heading off to our south and uh, get impacting more to the east on Thursday morning. And as we get into Thursday into the weekend, we're going to be getting those rain showers. But for tonight, we're going to be at low of 38 degrees. It's going to be clear skies, no chilly winds still out of the north. And then tomorrow is going to be about the same uh, 58 degrees for the high, mostly sunny skies. So it's going to be a beautiful day out there. Winds continue to be out of the north at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And here is your five-day forecast that I promised you. Uh, you can see that warming trend as we get into later in the week, but going to be about 55 here on Thursday. But then Friday, things finally start to warm up as we are going to be about 10 degrees warmer and continuing to warm up into the weekend. But the only sad news is that along with that warm up, we are going to have some chance for showers and thunderstorms as well into the weekend. So it's going to finally start to warm back up fierce here in about as we get into the weekend, but you're going to want to keep your umbrella handy as well. So Will and I were uh, possibly thinking about a nice romantic evening out at the dunes, you know, watching the stars, having a picnic, maybe yeah. crack a bottle of wine you know, or something. Just you make know. sure you bring that blanket with you. All right, it's so it is a possibility. At the beach, yes. Mm. That's off the record. I don't know what he's talking about. That's too much, Teddy. You took it too far. I'm sorry, but thanks, Emily. And up next, David Horak will join us for a look at Crusader Athletics. Stay with us.
interested in the television industry? Stop by our office in Schnabel Hall and join VU TV today. Hi, everybody. I'm Dick Vitale of ESPN, and I'm on VU TV. It's awesome, baby, with a capital A. What's good, everyone? I'm David Horak, and the latest in Valpo Athletics starts with the track and field program as the inaugural Crusader Open was held Saturday at the newly constructed Warren G. Hodger track at Brown Field. No team points were tallied, but a lot of individual gold medals were given to the crew that day, especially to the throwers. On the men's side, the throwers just dominated. Chris Sosnowski claimed first in discus. Jacob Frey seized the top spot in the hammer throw. And Jeremy Getz got the gold in the javelin throw. But wait, there's more. Alexander Watson, Elijah Owen, Kevin Adamik, and Nicholas Stack completely swept the top four spots in the pole vault. And on the track, Colin Wark ran through the finish first in the 3,000-meter steeplechase. On the women's side, the throwers put the pedal to get the gold medal. Sarah Dr Dozdowski clutched the hammer throw. Then she, Brooke Hinsdorf, and Heather Mend swept the top three spots in the javelin throw. Also, Sarah Peters soared over three and a half meters to claim first in the pole vault. On the track, Liz Bloy clutched first place in the 800-meter run, and Hannah Reynard got the gold in the 400-meter hurdles in just over a minute's time. The track and field team's next competition is this coming weekend at the Horizon League Outdoor Championships in Rochester, Michigan. The Valpo baseball team got two W's in a three-game series against Oakland this past weekend. That being said, the crew is now 16-21 with a 12-8 conference slate as they host Chicago State tomorrow, travel to NIU Wednesday, and host a three-game series against Milwaukee this weekend. The softball team was at Detroit this weekend for a three-game series of their own, and unfortunately, the crew was only able to come up with one W. They got, a, they got Bowling Green for a two-game series on Wednesday and then come back home to host a three-game series this weekend with Youngstown State. And the men's tennis team got swept by Green Bay in the Horizon League Championship match yesterday 4 to nothing, finishing their outstanding season with a 21-7 record this year. Uh, the men's tennis, uh, excuse me, the men's and women's golf finished fourth and sixth this year in the Horizon League Championship. Mayweather versus Pacquiao this weekend. Cannot wait. And the robotic football game against, uh, against uh, Purdue Kokomo went very, very well. 66 to 25. Head coach Hayden Haas and also uh, Valpo football players Jake Hudson and JT Rotroff. Very successful day. Very exciting. It was just awesome to experience that. And that's sports. Well, coming up after the break, Emily's back with a final look at your forecast. Stay with us. On a campus plagued with terrible weather, Valpo students suffer from boredom with no motivation to leave their room. They begin to search for free movies and stumble upon Valpo's new free movie streaming website, where you get unlimited free access to recent movies like 
Despicable Me Too, and Jobs at the tips of your fingers. So if you're feeling bored, then don't wait. Grab some friends, find a seat, and enjoy a movie on movies.valpo.edu. Emily joins us for a final look at your Storm Shield forecast. Emily, what do we have this next week to look forward to? This next week we have look, look forward to is some warmer temperatures on the way. It's going to be a little bit chillier to start out on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Cooler temperatures with those lows actually still in the 30s, uh, so we're well below our average. But then finally Friday through Saturday, it's going to start to warm up, finally get into the 70s this weekend, and it was those low temperatures warming up as well. But the sad news is that along with those warmer temperatures, we're going to see some rain. So Will, does that uh, disrupt any of your uh, Frisbee plans? No, unfortunately, we actually ended our season this past weekend. Okay. We had a regionals tournament, um, came in fourth. So that's, that's why I have no voice, by the way. I'm not a chain smoker. Uh, yeah, we just did a lot of yelling. You do that at a Frisbee tournament. But uh, we played well. We played well. We, we had some well-fought games. So mm -hmm. I was pretty happy. Yeah, but for sure. It's been thanks nice. Thanks for asking. Yeah, no problem. You're welcome. And, yeah, yeah and right. what about for sports? Do you guys play, have any plans? Uh, any? Nothing really. Just chill back. Maybe enjoy watching, watching these guys. Kindle the moment. <laughs> nope. Uh, I got some extra sunscreen if you want. You <laughs> Head on to the beach. It's going to be a little chilly and rainy for that. So unless you're planning on bringing an umbrella and playing some puddles, I would not be heading to the beach this weekend. And thanks, Emily. That's all we have for this edition of The Shield. For Will, Emily, and David, I'm Teddy Reithmeyer. Have a great night.